you know the Tom R. It's been here a long time. You know the Tom R. Lives in Duxbury. You don't know that Tom R. Owns a second home in Brewster on Cape Cod. You don't know that Tom R. Has two very nice vehicles and I am comfortable in life. What you don't know, I was born in the three family. Then we went to a two family. And then finally at age 12, my father bought a single family home. I will never, ever forget that. My father was a very hardworking man, and he imparted that to me. So I worked very hard. I've worked very hard all my life, and I'm a lucky man. I uh, went to Boston College after graduating from Boston Latin School. I came to teach at Catholic Memorial. Uh, I have a lovely wife. I have two lovely daughters, my two daughters. And you got to be lucky that you're near your family, if you are near your family, because my oldest daughter lives in San Francisco, California, and my youngest daughter lives in a city just north of Dallas called Frisco, Texas. And we will be in Frisco, Texas for Thanksgiving next week. And uh, do I miss them? Of course. Of course I do. But there's nothing I can do about that. Their lives are wonderful lives. They have wonderful husbands. I have three beautiful grandchildren. I'm a lucky man. Uh, I coached track here at Catholic Memorial High School. Then I coached at my alma mater, Boston College. At Boston College, I was very fortunate to coach not one, but two All-Americans. I got out of coaching and get into uh, track and field officiating. I've been very, very fortunate in track and field officiating because uh, I've done a lot of wonderful things. Um, I've done 14 Division I National Collegiate Track Championships. I've started, and I shoot the gun in track and field, I've started um, two world championships, and I've started two Olympic trials, United States Olympic trials. Sometimes people talk about the pressure and intensity of doing those things. I will tell you, you can't believe the pressure that is on that infield, on that track, at the United States American Track and Field Trials when we're taking three people to the Olympics, not taking four, just taking three. And when you see the closeness sometimes of the position between third and fourth, thousand, one, one thousand, two, one thousandth of a second. Wow. And so um, how lucky have I have been to be at that particular um, hierarchy of track and field in America? Very, very fortunate man to have that in my life. Now, I will tell you that um, I have done a couple of other things I'm very proud of. I started a road race in the little town of Brewster, Massachusetts, 39 years ago. This year will be 40. I have raised almost $475,000 for the fire department and rescue squad. The last eight years, I have ridden in the Pan Mass Challenge. Um, and I've raised just shy of $100,000 in eight years. Well, lucky am I. I have been involved in the boat with the Boston Marathon for 27 years or so. The last uh, 21 years, I've been in charge of the finish line. The finish line of the Boston Marathon is um, <clears throat> its high end. It's, um, people would say there's a lot of pressure there. I don't really feel the pressure because I've done it and I know how to get it done. But I will tell you um, that if you make a mistake, if I were to make a mistake of any kind of major proportion, someone else would be doing that job next year not me. So I've gotten it right for 21 years. And uh, in fact, about five years ago, a Kenyan uh, won the race. My job is to greet the winner. 
to ascertain his physical and mental condition, maybe get him some water, I'll let him compose himself before he goes up for his award uh, and the national anthem of his country. That happened five years ago, and the winner came, and uh, I had the two police officers, City of Boston police officers, escort him to the finish area. All of a sudden, it hit me. Wow, he just ran 203. That's a world's record. It didn't even dawn on me for about five to eight minutes because I was so intense on getting done what I have to do with that finish line. And things have always gone well there. I always tell the security people in the area, I am most concerned about someone jumping over the fence from the crowd, coming onto the street and causing a disruption. Could it be someone who's from Kenya or Ethiopia who was from a rival, rival tribe? Possibly. So, you know, I know it's nice that when you're standing on the street to watch the win across the line, but you have to be focused on the crowds. On the one side, which is the library side, we have the grandstand. Admission to the grandstand is by ticket only. But any civilian can walk up the other side of, the, of Wilson Street and on the north side and stand there. And the crowds are probably, if you've never been down there, I don't know, 12, 15, 18 deep on the sidewalk. April 15th. This opened some wounds for me a little bit, as <laughs> you can tell. April 15, 2013. I had gone up on the platform, the timing platform, to talk to the computer people. I wanted to find out where a couple of people were, one of whom was a soldier who was going off to Afghanistan a week later, and the other was my niece. So I went up on the platform and I found out the information. So the computer can spit out, as you well realize, where the athlete is, what's the last checkpoint the athlete went over, what their average time is, what's their estimated time of arrival to the finish line. So I came off the platform and the finish mats were behind me. There's a mat up the road that the announcer uses to identify uh, people. You know, here comes John Jones coming across the finish line. He's from, he's from Tewksbury. Give him a round, round of applause. Someone, one of my security people had stopped me. There's a television camera over here from a television station in Brattleboro, Vermont, or Burlington, Vermont. Uh, should I ask him to leave? WBZ in Boston has exclusive rights to the marathon. There should be no other, no other TV stations are allowed to put their cameras on the street. And so um, I said, no, that's fine. He had talked to me for 10, 12 seconds. As I started to move forward to go down the street to tell a couple of officials, this is who I'm looking for. Here's the bib numbers that they are wearing. The bomb went off. I knew it was a bomb immediately. Some people said, didn't you think it was a gas explosion? No, I knew it was a bomb. When I shoot the gun in track and field, I use a black powder substance in the shell. I know the smell of a bomb. It was a bomb. I could see a wave of glass and smoke coming across the street. And uh, I saw an individual, an older gentleman in an orange singlet, stumble and go down. I ran to assist that individual because I thought he had been hit by the glass and the shrapnel. At the time, I did not know that in the bomb there were uh, nails and pieces of metal which were designed to injure, maim, and or kill people. I ran to help him. Um, when I got to him, one of my security people was picking him up. Um, at the time, I hadn't realized there was a photographer behind me. And I probably didn't realize until I saw the paper the next day. I turned to look at the sidewalk. 
what I saw was horrific. As I'm looking at the sidewalk, he takes my picture. In the distance, down the street on Boylston Street, the orange glow of the second bomb exploding. So I've been asked before, weren't you fearful running to that bomb, to that? No, I don't think I was fearful. I don't think fear went to my mind. I was angry. I was of trying to help someone who I thought got knocked down. And you know, that piece of turf belongs to me. I take a lot of pride in making sure that that goes well. Uh, as I was standing there, uh, National Guardsmen and policemen start running to the scene and ripping down the barricades. There's snow fencing there and a metal barricade. My inclination was to go forward and try to help. But you know, it was part and parcel of what happened that day, I think, had that security guy not asked me the question about the TV station from Burlington, Vermont, I was going to be walking down that side of the street. And would I have been directly in front of the bomb? Maybe. But I would have been a lot closer than the 20 yards I was when it went off. I don't think about that very often, but clearly um, that thought has entered my mind on occasion. Um, I'm standing there, um, medical per personnel raced into the scene, and uh, after a few minutes, um, I had a little flip phone, cell phone, so I flipped it open and I said, uh, I called my wife and I said, a bomb just went off here. I'm okay. Call my girls. And then out came a gurney stretcher with uh, three EMTs. One pulling, one pushing, and one frantically giving CPR to a young woman on a stretcher. And I said to myself, she's dead. And she was. It was Crystal Gamble. And I do know that when she got to the big medical tent, um, they tried to put, they put the paddles on her and try to revive her and were unable to do so. Um, I then was told by the Boston police in no uncertain terms to get out of here. <laughs> so I went up to the corner of Dartmouth and Boylston, stayed there for a few minutes, was thrown out of there, went over in front of the Copley. And whether you know it or not, all the cell phone service in Boston went dead. No one could talk to anyone. Um, when I finally left there and got to my car and drove down the expressway, it was down about East Milton Square before I could get service on my uh, cell phone. And you know, um, I've been asked before many times, a number of times, especially that year. You're not going back there next year, are you? What? Of course I'm going back there next year. Why wouldn't I go back there next year? Or wouldn't you be afraid? No. That's, as we know, one of the psychological tools that terrorists like to use. If they can't get you and maim you and or kill you, they want to get right in here. About 10 days later, I got a call from a sergeant who ran the stress unit at the Boston Police Department. He happens to be a graduate of Catholic Memorial. And uh, so he said, I want you to come over here and sit down with our counselors. I said, look, I'm fine. I, I, don't, need, uh, I don't need counseling, I'm fine. No, get over here. So I realized he's reaching out to help me. Of course I have to go over there. So I went over and sat down with their counselors for about an hour or so. And uh, the, uh, the thing that um, I was having a difficult thing with was that people call me a hero for what I did.
I don't think I was a hero for what I did. I just did the right thing. I was asked to appear on, uh, and I did appear on the Today Show the next morning at the corner of Arlington and uh, Boylston Street at the Boston Public Gardens. Uh, the Today Show, Matt Lauer. Um, after I was done with him, Lester Holt interviewed me in the Boston Gardens. Um, I was interviewed that same day. I actually went over and did a track meet uh, that day after the marathon at the Harvard Yale meet over in Harvard. And I was interviewed by uh, um, the sports editor from Sports Illustrated, uh, who happened to be at the Harvard Yale meet for another reason. But, um, and then we had a meeting um, on Wednesday. The organizing committee had a meeting. and. Um, I was told by, as a group, there was a big bunch of people in the room, we were told, do not talk to the press under any circumstances. Well, I was supposed to do an interview with the New York Times, and there's a gentleman who does interviews on television, his name is Geraldo Rivera. I was supposed to appear on his show on Saturday night, and I, and I did not, and um, because they told me um, not to do that. So, of course, I didn't, I didn't do it. Um, so that night I got in my car and I, drove, I did drove home, I told you that, and I stopped for a burger and relaxed and went home. And uh, To this day I've never had a nightmare or I never don't wake up in the middle of the night with, um, with um, shaking or thinking about what happened to me. And what happened to me, it's an emotional thing. And I get emotional talking about emotional things. I can get emotional talking about that, my family, my country. And I'm a person that, um, one of the things I'm also, in, that I do on a daily basis, I get in my car and leave Duxbury at 5.25 in the morning. And, and the, the two mile drive from my house to the highway is my morning, my, my morning of solitude, my morning of prayer. And I pray. Pray for my family, pray for people that I know, pray for people that I don't, sometimes don't really know, but I know they have cancer. And because I ride in that pan mass challenge, that's such an important part of my life, praying for people and helping people who have cancer. Now I'm gonna tell you that, um, <laughs> I actually thought subconsciously before April 15, 2013, never was on my plate. It was always somewhere back in here as a thought. Like, I'm, I feel pretty good. You know, I'm an old guy, but I feel pretty good. So I probably had built up this MO in my mind that, you know something? Nothing's ever gonna happen to me. I've been having some back problems. It was a congenital thing, um, so on, uh, in October of 2013, same year, at, at Mass General Hospital, I had spinal surgery. And I was on the table for nine hours. I'll never forget waking up in anesthesia, and it's dark in the room, and I, the nurse comes over and says, oh, you're awake now, you're, how are you feeling? <laughs> Nine hours of anesthesia, <laughs> you're asking me questions about how I feel. So then I hear this, this is a little a side story, funny story. I hear this noise, I hear this women screaming, happy scream. So the nurse comes back and I'm thinking, what's that noise? Oh, that's the nurse's station. David Ortiz just hit a home run to beat the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> And like, what? <laughs> I couldn't get over that component. <laughs> so I come home and I do my rehab and I, I'm doing my walking and I, my doctor was great there and uh, how lucky was I to be at having that situation taken care of in there. Um, on August in 2014, um, I was selected as a starter at the World Junior Track Championships at the University of Oregon. Before I left, I was having stomach problems. I went out, I was taking these antacid pills, but they weren't working. I came home. Um, doctor said, I want you to have a stress test. Well, you know, in a couple of weeks, Doc, I got my Pan Mass Challenge bike ride, 160 miles. Come on. So 
So, okay, I'll have the stress test as soon as it's done. So I rode 160 miles in two days on the bike, 80 a day. Had the stress test. Um, doctor said, I think this, I think this, even though you did very well in the stress test, I think there's something. I want to go in and look around. He went and looked around and found that I had a 99% blocked artery. So I rode 160 miles with a 99% blocked artery. So he put two stents in. Okay, I'm on medication now. I'm fine. Um, in October, that October, after the stents went in in August, end of August, went out for a ride and when I came home, I had a little blood in my urine. So I went back to the doctor and I said, this is what happened. And um, they gave me a test for my kidney and then he had to test my bladder. It went into my bladder, took out a polyp. It was cancerous. I have cancer? How could I have cancer? I had cancer. And then starting the first week in January of 2015, um, I started with treatments to treat so that cancer wouldn't uh, recur. And the, the treatment's called BCG. It's a synthetic bacteria and it's used to treat tuberculosis. It was in your bladder. You keep it in your bladder for a couple of hours and then discharge. So I finished the six treatments and here we are February 2015. That was the winter of <laughs> no school. February, just kept snowing the whole winter, if you can recall that. And so I'm out with the snow blower, snow blowing, snow blowing. All of a sudden, it felt like someone had punched me, like a hard punch, right there. Now we will tell you, I have been a runner most of my life. I have pushed my body, well, not beyond limits, but I've, I've gotten there pretty, pretty close. I know what it's like. <laughs> I know that. I never felt this before, ever. So I, put the, I started to walk the snowblower away. We were in the house and sat down, and it went away. Something's wrong. 911. I went to the South Shore Hospital. They moved me into the city. The next day, I had quadruple bypass. And with quadruple bypass surgery, you have blocked arteries. So they're going to take an artery out of your leg. And I now have what I call a zipper. It's a scar that goes from here to here. Um, and uh, about a month and a half later, I went to the doctor, my cardiologist, and I said, look, I'm already signed up for this Pan Mass Challenge. I've ridden the two day, 160 mile ride. I want to ride. He said, well, your heart is very strong. I said, how about if I do just the one day, just 80 miles? Okay, you can do that. So I rode the 80 miles. I got to Provincetown, honest to God, I got to Provincetown, I was about coming into the finish where people are cheap, cheering, screaming, yelling. <laughs> the tears were flowing. All I could think of was five and a half months earlier, I was on a table, they had opened me up, put the new <laughs> artery in, zip me back up, tape me all up, and I had strings coming out of my stomach. So in a span of one year and 10 months, less than two years, you know what the lesson is? You are just like everybody else. You think you're going to escape things happen to you in your life? I will stand here right now. Not that I'll be able to track you when you're my age, obviously I'll be long gone. But I will stand here right now and tell you, you can't even begin to believe the things that are going to happen to you in your life. Now, I'm not saying oh, bad, bad, bad things. And maybe difficult, challenging, bad things have happened to you and your family. They happen to everybody. I can never figure out why this isn't evenly distributed to families in life. It's not. Some families get hit much harder than other families. Why does that happen? 
All I know is when I get in my car tomorrow morning, I'll say my prayers on the way to the highway. And all I can say to you is you need to be focused on your life. You need to be strong. And I will tell you, sitting down is never an option. You get knocked down, get back up on your feet, and you might not be happy. You might not like it. Don't ever go in a corner and sit down. Don't ever quit. Don't ever say, I can't do that. Don't ever do that. Because you have the inner strength and clearly the ability to overcome. You know, adversity is only a problem when you let it take over you. You gotta fight adversity all the time, every day. And you can do it, and you will do it. Thank you.